Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over a game between Tall and Vladimir Samajin. Now this is from the 1956 Russian Championships. Both players extremely talented, Tall being one of the greatest tactical minds in chess ever, and Vladimir Samajin being one of the strongest Russian grandmasters to ever come out of Russia, which is saying a lot considering Russia has an immense amount of talent pool that comes out of Russia each year. And this is an exciting game. I really like to study a lot of famous chess games. Um, Tall being one of my favorite players just because he is so relentless in the way that he attacks. He's super aggressive. And in this game he does just that. He pretty much just throws out typical moves that you would see in a chess game and just goes after his opponent's king the entire game. So it's really fun to watch. At the same time it's fun to analyze. So hopefully you guys will enjoy the game and at the same time will learn something from it. Tall playing the white pieces started with e4, responded by c6, d4, and d6. Now a lot of times in play now you'll just see pawn to d5, the Karakhan, but Vladimir did have a lot of success at this time with pawn to d6. So it's not a bad move, kind of a waiting move, not trying to really control the center of the board right now, um, but at the same time he is letting Tall pretty much dominate the center. So as most top level players do, if you're going to allow them to dominate the center, they're going to do, do just that. Tall now plays knight to c3, again just a simple development move. You always want to get your minor pieces involved into the game early. Typically you'll get your knights involved before your bishops. In this case c3 and f3 are typical places for your knight just because they can not only defend your pawns in the center but also attack different squares in the center as well. So this square here on d5 is being attacked as well as defending this pawn here on e4. So a great square for the knight here on c3. Now black again decided to develop his knight to f6. Great move here, again attacking this square on d5 and also attacking this pawn here on e4. Now Tall now plays pawn to f4, which makes a lot of sense, again trying to attack the center, but he could have also played knight to f3. Now this is kind of the safer move. Both are, you know, fine moves. Both are attacking the center, trying to gain center control. Um, but f4 is a lot more aggressive, and kind of like I told you, Tall is a super aggressive player, so anytime there's a choice between a safe and an aggressive move, he's pretty much going to take the aggressive route. So f4, uh, very good move, also very aggressive to try to aim and completely dominate the center of the board. As you can see here, pretty much every square from c c5, excuse me, all the way to g5 here, pretty much all being attacked once or twice from white here. From here, black's going to play queen to b6, trying to get another piece involved into the game, attacking the center of the board at the same time, putting a lot of pressure on this pawn on b2, really stopping white from developing this minor piece here on c1. He can't move his bishop because then this pawn will be lost. So really, this is a, a kind of twofold move, which you'll see a lot at Grandmaster play here. Um, it doesn't really matter for white, he's just going to continue with his other minor pieces on the king side of the board. He's going to bring his knight to f3. Again, simple development, trying to control the center of the board. No sides really doing anything crazy right now, just trying to develop a plan. Um, typically at the beginning of the game, you just want to control the center and kind of see what your opponent does. So from here, black's going to play bishop to g4. Again, simple development move at the same time, bringing it in pinning down this knight to the queen here. So this knight's not doing too much right away. And so Tall right away brings his bishop to e2, getting ready to castle on the king side at the same time trying to alleviate this pin here from the knight on f3. Now black's now going to bring his knight to d7. As you can see, most of all the minor pieces and this queen here have been developed for black. He at one time will bring either his pawn to g6 or he'll either push his pawn to e6 and e5. Go ahead and get this bishop out of the way so he can castle on one of the sides and connect both of his rooks. But in the meantime we see white over here and all he has to do is develop one of his minor pieces and then his queen, castle, and he has completed development here. Now white really has two options here. He can go ahead and castle kingside if he wants to or he can start to push up the board. Now if we really look at it there's really no other moves that he can do. Again you really don't want to move your minor pieces twice in the beginning of the game if you don't have a good reason. Tall really doesn't have a good reason here now. You really don't want to play pawn to h3. More than likely he's going to castle on the king side. Uh, it's going to be a few more moves before he can castle on the queen side. And playing h3 really starts to break down the defense on the king side. So h3 is not really an option. Um, 
And so he really has castling on the king side, and he has pawn to e5. Now, castling on king side is kind of a waiting move. Pawn to e5 kind of starts to push the action, is a little bit more aggressive. So as you can imagine, this is exactly what Tal does. He plays pawn to e5. Now, Black's knight is being attacked here on f6, so he has one of two options. He can take it with his pawn on e5, or he can move his knight. Now, Black decides to move his knight, and from here, White now castles on the king side. Now, from here, Black goes ahead and takes on c3, and now White has doubled pawns on the c file. Now, keep in mind, double pawns on the c file is not nearly as bad as on the a or the b file. Obviously, you never want to have double pawns, but if you are, you'd rather have them near the center of the board. So this is not the worst thing in the world, um, and I'm sure Tall looked at this and, and thought that it was okay once he played e5. So from here, black plays pawn to e6. Again, he really needs to have some room for his bishop to get out of here, or he's not going to castle on the king's side, and the king's going to be stuck in the middle of the game. That's really not what you want to have. Now, if we kind of look at this from Tall's perspective, um, trying to find a good move for him, uh, his bishop's really not going to do anything. He can't bring it to b2 here. Uh, bringing it to a3 isn't doing a whole lot. Um, it's kind of out there on its own, not doing too much. The queen, the queen's really going to block off the bishop if he comes to d2 um, or d3, for that matter. Um, so where is he really going to go? He, obviously, he has this knight here. So he decides to play knight to g5. And this is really starting an attack that he has in the back of his mind. And at the same time, he's really trying to come up with some sort of plan, but alleviate some of the pressure that this dark square bishop has on, or excuse me, this light square bishop has on the knight here on f3. Now from here, black just immediately takes this bishop here on e2, and both sides trade off, and now black plays h6. Now again, this knight here on g5 is kind of a thorn in black's side, because he really doesn't know what he's going to do with it. So he plays h6, expecting, you know, white to move his knight back, um, and just kind of progress on the game from here. What Black forgot to realize, though, is he's actually playing tall. And that's not really how he plays. He's not really going to bring his piece back. Instead, he's just going to attack your king all day long. Now, a lot of GMs and a lot of people who have analyzed this game have looked at this move and say, you know what, he really didn't need to do this. He could have easily brought his knight back to h3. They're like, in a professional game, if they would have done it, they would have moved the knight back and had a comfortable game. Um... This is why their games will never be remembered, and we're studying Tall's game right now. Because Tall plays knight to f7, and no one else would do that. So, um, with that said, the king took on f7, and now we start to really see Tall's brilliance. Obviously, you can see the king is in the center of the board here with king to f7. Um, so, Tall really needs to start to open up the game. If there's just pawns everywhere, and he can't really attack with any of his pieces then the attack really does no good. At the same time, any time in a chess game that you're going to sack a piece, it better be for good measure. You're not really going to play defensive. And so in this case, Tall really needs to play aggressive. So Tall plays pawn to f5. Now Black does have multiple options on how he can take back. He decides to take on e5 with his pawn from d6. And then White plays pawn to e6 taking it at the same time, double attacking this king here on f7. The king has to move, so he takes on e6. And now white has one of the best moves in the game. Now I'll get to my favorite move in the game, um, but go ahead and pause it if you can see and formulate a plan for white. And white actually played rook to b1. And this is a fantastic move. As you can see, he's attacking the, the queen. But if you look at it from black's perspective, um, there's really not a lot of good moves for black. Now, if you look and you're like, Kevin, why don't he just take the rook? That's actually what he does in the game, because that's really his only option. He really doesn't want to retreat his queen back to c7 or d8. He really needs it in the middle of the board, so we can kind of use it to defend his king here. Um, you never want to kind of leave your king in the middle of the board while your opponent just attacks you relentlessly. Um, so in this case, he does take the rook on b1, and it kind of looks like it is lost. kind of looks like he just sacked a rook. Um, that's actually not what he did, though. So he first plays queen to c4. Fantastic move. If you came up with all these on your own, um, I don't believe you at all, but congratulations anyway. 
And from here, the king came to d6. Again, he didn't really have any moves. The rook here is just dominating the f file here. And now the bishop can come to a3. And as you can see here, it's a check and a discovered attack on the queen to b1. So the queen is going to lose. Um, and obviously, both sides lost a piece. But obviously, white gained a piece. But as you can see here, once the king moves and the queen is captured on b1, then this bishop here on a3 is going to fall. Now you're like, now why would he, he's just losing all these pieces. All he has left is a queen here on c4 and this rook here on b1. That's a fantastic point. He's better than we are at chess, and so he can do whatever he wants to. But in this case, he brings his queen back to b3, and it does one of two things. One, it's attacking this bishop, which if white were to take this bishop and it is a queen and a rook, to a knight and two rooks, that's really not that bad of an exchange. A queen is, you know, roughly around um, a rook and a knight, give or take a pawn or so. Um, so in this case, it wouldn't be too bad if he could take this bishop. At the same time, the bishop can retreat, but he's also eyeing down this b7 pawn, which is not only taking another pawn, but at the same time ta attacking the king and sort of forcing it to come to the middle of the board. And that's exactly what happened. So the black bishop retreats to e7, and the white queen comes to b7, and he takes it. Now, as you can see here, white is still down quite a bit of material, and so it has to be very, very tactical in the way Tall plays, um, or else he's going to lose, because as far as material, he is down in material. So he has to make every move count. Now, black has to move his king here, so he brings it to d6. And now white takes on e5, attacking the king. Now, obviously, as you can see here, he takes, forcing the king to come to the middle of the board. Now, the knight takes here on e5, and so then white starts to really chase the king around the board. So the first brings his rook to d1. As you can see here, also, not only did that pawn kind of force some of the action to the middle of the board, but it also opened up this D file here, which with the pawn really wasn't doing anything, so you always want to open up files and the board. As you can see, as we talked about earlier, when Tall really started his attack, the game was kind of closed. There were pawns everywhere. Um, as he's kind of unfolded this entire plan of action, uh, the board's kind of opened up, which is exactly what you want to do when you're attacking. You want to have as many squares to work with as possible, especially if you're working with a queen and a rook that need long files and diagonals. You want to open things up. So that's exactly what Tall does. So from here, black played e6, and the queen came back to b3. Again, tactically just attacking. The king cannot come back to the d file, so he's going to be chased to the right-hand side. And now the rook's going to come to f1 here. He would really like his rook on e1. So as you can see here, the king's going to come back to e4, and the rook's going to come to e1. And it kind of looks like it's the same situation as before. The king's back on f5, but you can see here, instead of the rook being on d1, it is now on e1. So from here, the pawn's going to come to g4, attacking the king. Now, there's not very much that black can do here except retreat back. Obviously, if the knight were to come here and take on g4, then this bishop would be hanging. If the king takes here on g4, then the knight would be hanging. Neither of those are good, as we talked about before. It would be much better. Um, for Tall, if he has a queen and a rook versus just a minor piece and two rooks, especially since both of these rooks back here have not moved the entire game. So, obviously, as we've talked about in many other videos, it's not always how many pieces you have, it's how many active pieces you have. In this case, Black does not have that many active pieces. His bishop isn't doing much. His knight right now is in the middle of the board. He's not really attacking or defending anything. So white, in my opinion, definitely has an advantage, even though he is down in material. Um, so from here, we can see the king kind of has to retreat. So the king comes back to f6, and now the rook comes to f1. Now, as you can see, the king cannot come back to e6 now because of the queen, so he's forced to move even farther. So the king comes to g6, and now the queen can come into the game to e6. You can see the pressure is really starting to build on black. So after the king moves to h7, now white can take this knight here on e5. So this is, it's starting to, to unfold here, but still, white really only has a queen and a rook. There's not a whole lot of firepower, and black still has, you know, two major pieces and a, you know, dark square bishop in an open game, which isn't really too bad. 
Now keep in mind, even though the computer says this is winning for white, this is not an easy game by any means for white to finish. Black does have two rooks, and once he gets them developed into the game and attacking along all these open files, it's going to be a pretty hard for white to win this, especially since he only has two major pieces left. But from here, black played rook to e8. Obviously, he wants to get his rooks involved into the game. And obviously, he does have some discovered attacks. Anytime he moves his bishop, he's going to be attacking the queen here. And now the rook comes to f7. Again, just relentlessly putting pressure. Obviously, we can see here that queen takes on g7 is going to be checkmate. Black really has to do something about that. And he brings his bishop back to f8. Now, at the same time, he's protecting this pawn here on g7. And he's also attacking the queen here on the e5. Now the queen's going to have to do something and the queen comes to f5 attacking this king here on h7. The king's going to have to move. He comes back to g8. Now from here, white really had to stop and think and he kind of had to formulate a new plan. And his new plan that he, that he came up with, if you can look at the board and come up with it yourself, that's fantastic. He really reached an end game that he said, you know what, I really need to get my king in safety. And if I can get my king in safety and march him up the board and help out, that's even better. So his plan was kind of to move his king like this. Kind of up the board, kind of come into the action if he could, kind of help out with the attack. But in the meantime, he definitely wanted to kind of hide it behind this pawn on g4. Again, this is going to be really hard for rooks to get to. It's always good to look at what your opponent has left and how they're going to get to it. So if your opponent has dark squared bishops, Always put your king on light squares. He can never attack it. In this case, his king here over on this h file, it's going to be really hard for him to attack, especially if his king gets to, let's say, h4. It's really going to be hard for those rooks to attack at any time. So from here, White decided to start to activate his king. Now, he brought his king to f2, and now the bishop king to c5. Now, again, as we talked about, this bishop is defending this you know, square here on g7, but since he is attacking the king here on f2, it does not really matter. So from here, the king is going to come to g3, and then the rook is going to come to e3. This is very good because he is moving his pieces, and at the same time, he is attacking. So he's kind of gaining tempos here as white marches up the board. Now, white really doesn't care because this is kind of his plan. He wants to kind of move his king and get him involved into the game. So he brings his king to h4. And he's going to hang out there for a while because this is exactly the game plan. It's kind of safe here. wasn't safe before. But now white can kind of attack and attack. So from here, black's going to bring his other rook to e8. You always want to connect your rooks. Even if they're on the back row, you want them connected. If they're on a single file, you want them connected because they can protect each other and they can attack and cannot be you know, taken by a king or something else. So you always want to connect them no matter where they are on the board, especially open files, you want them connected. Now from here is a fantastic move from white, and in my opinion, the best move in the game. And if you want to pause and take a look at it and see if you can find it yourself, I say go for it. Um, but the move is this. It's rook takes on g7. If you kind of look at it, it's, it's kind of strange. First time I looked at it, I was like, that that's kind of weird. You have two major pieces left. Your opponent has two rooks and a bishop. You really need pieces to attack, and you're going to sacrifice one of your strongest pieces left on the board. Why would you ever do that? And he does it because he had a game plan. He realized he's going to take this pawn, he's going to take this bishop, and he's going to either take this pawn or this pawn on a7, for that trade and he knows it doesn't matter if he takes this pawn on c6 or a7 he's going to have a pass pawn it could be on the a file or the c file he's going to have a pass pawn so he decides he can pretty much with his king here on h4 kind of just hanging out not being able to do anything with his queen he's going to be able to chase these pieces and this king all over the board that he's going to be able to promote one of these pass pawns now i'm sure he looked at this for a long time and calculated out um, which I think is just fantastic because I'm not playing rook takes on g7, but that's why tall is a lot better than I am at chess. So as you can imagine, black has to recapture on g7, and the queen comes to c5 capturing the bishop. Obviously attacking both the pawn here on a7 and the pawn here on c6. Now unfortunately for black, this is going to be a tough in game for him. Typically two rooks against a queen is not bad. The only problem is it's going to be really hard for black to do much. It's going to be hard for one for him to, to 
to attack this king at all. But at the same time, any time since this black king is out in the open and there's really no protection, any time these black rooks move, um, white can kind of swoop in and double attack, attack both the king here on g7 and one of the rooks. So he has to be very careful that he doesn't lose one of his, his rooks to a fork here. So um, right now, black has to decide which pawn he's going to defend. Uh, personally, I would play rook to e7. I think it's much easier to kind of stop the pass pawn on the c file because it kind of is in the middle of the board. The a file over here, it's pretty much kind of segregated from everything else. It's really going to be hard to stop a passed a pawn over here. Um, the queen can pretty much dominate the center of the board and the rooks can't get over there. But in any case, in the actual game, the rook came to e6 and white played queen takes on e a7. Um, so as you can see here, this a pawn is ready to go just straight up the entire board. At the same time, he is checking this king here on g7. The king is going to come to g6. Obviously, he wants to come to the most protected place possible. If he comes to the 8th rank, that does him absolutely no good. The queen's going to come to a8, getting ready to come to the action if he needs to. And at the same time, he's still on this a file, so he can just push up this pawn anytime he wants to. Now, from here, the king is going to come back to f6, and then white starts his journey up the board with pawn to a5. Now, you can pause and look at it. I've analyzed it and read a lot of other people's analysis of the game it's really hard for black to stop this pawn coming up the a file even though he has two rooks there's not a lot of great moves where he can stop this a a pawn going up the board uh, the king does come to e5 trying to centralize it trying to make his way over it's kind of a you know a futile point here um, but the pawn's just going to keep going it doesn't really matter nothing's stopping him uh, now he does bring his queen to d8 again with tempo obviously attacking the king uh, the king is now going to come back to e4. Kind of his plan is stopped, so, you know, it's really pointless, but the pawn is just going to keep on going. So the king now comes to f3. The pawn now comes to a7. And now the rook comes to e2. Now keep in mind, even grandmasters can make, you know, huge mistakes. So white cannot play something like, you know, pawn to a8 and then promote to a queen. He can't do that. Why? Because that's checkmate right there. So even though White's definitely winning the game and he's going to win, you still have to be, you know, mindful of what your opponent has, the attacks he has, because so many times you look at games and you think you're completely dominating, and then your opponent back rank makes you, mates you, or you know, does something else and mates you. Always look at what your opponent has as an attack. So from here, um, Tall decided to bring his queen down to d3. He decided the one piece that's pretty much won the entire game for him, he's going to sacrifice just as kind of a, a booyah, I'm better than you at chess, which I think is fantastic. So from here, black played rook to e3, and tall decided, let's just go ahead and sacrifice, it doesn't matter, because once you take, then I'm going to promote, and I have a queen, and I'm up two pawns, it's going to be a very easy game. So from here, black decided to resign the game, which... I probably would have resigned a long time ago, but um, in this position, he resigned. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this game. Some fantastic moves. Um, really encouraging to see someone at this top level in a championship game, nonetheless, play such an aggressive style and just sacrifice pieces all over the board. So hopefully you guys enjoyed and, and learned something. If you haven't already, please subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.